The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled Personalizing and Advancing Modern Treatment Approaches to Prostate Cancer. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash TGE 860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Thank you for joining us this morning for uh, this short CME program on uh, personalizing and advancing modern treatment approaches to prostate cancer. So let's get started. Um, we're going to talk about castration-sensitive metastatic prostate cancer first, and then we'll move on from there. So um, when we look at the space of um, prostate cancer from biochemical failure on, uh, in the non-metastatic setting, there's still limited uptake of some of the oral agents that have, approved, have been approved on the basis of overall survival. In the castrate-sensitive metastatic setting, um, there is compelling evidence, which I will summarize briefly, about the role of intensification of ADT. It is uh, perhaps surprisingly but shockingly dramatically underutilized in the United States, and I'll come back to that. And in the MCRPC setting, there are still multiple lines of therapies that many patients do not receive. So when you think about the uh, available therapeutics and the, the developments in, in therapy options, there's a lot of educational deficits in, among the clinicians who practice. So a case, which we'll come back to uh, in a bit, but this is a 60-year-old gentleman who sees you in consultation. Five years ago, um, he had a PSA of 12, ultimately underwent a prostatectomy. You see the pathology, Gleason 7 with tertiary 5. Biochemical failure, shortly thereafter, got salvage radiotherapy. Did okay, but three years ago, biochemical failure, he gets imaged, he has a solitary sacral bone med, somebody sticks a needle in it, it's positive. He gets radiotherapy to the area with six months of ADT. Now, when you see him in clinic, he's asymptomatic, his PSA is 66, his ECOG is zero, hemoglobin 11, his testosterone has recovered, 455, CT of the chest, abdomen, pelvis, bone lesions, no other evidence of disease, a bone scan is done, Abby normal bone scan. All right, so clinical state. So Howard Scher, 21 years ago, published the clinical states model. It didn't look like this. It was much simpler. But one of the things that, how, you know, how important that was, was it began to make us think about the disease in subsets. We all recognize the heterogeneity of the disease. But Howard sort of asked us to think about the disease in buckets, which were both clinically relevant as well as helping us do clinical research. Uh, this is a modulation of that, and you see additional buckets. Many of them have therapy options. And we begin to change how we do clinical research as well as clinical management on the basis of this. So let's step back for a second and think about prostate cancer. Again, this is an extremely heterogeneous disease. You all know that. But one of the other things that doesn't get discussed a lot is that it's also, for a solid tumor, one of the diseases that's managed by a disparate group of clinicians. So there are community urologists who take care of this disease. There are large urology group practices that have advanced prostate cancer clinics with sophisticated management. There are community medical oncologists, and depending on where those community medocs practice, they may see some of this disease or they may not see very much if they're located near large urology group practices with advanced prostate cancer clinics. There are GU medocs, like my colleague and I, and then there are radiation oncologists, both in the community and academic centers. All of these folks manage patients with advanced prostate cancer, and how these patients are managed does differ to some extent based on which clinician is taking care of them. Hormone-sensitive and castration-sensitive doesn't mean always hormonal therapy naive. As we know, hormonal therapy is used with or without evidence at a variety of different places in the disease course. There has been a dramatic leftward movement of therapeutics. We are using therapies that were approved in MCRPC now in castrate-sensitive disease or non-metastatic castrate-resistant disease, and this is a paradigm that will likely continue. We in the United States are finally caught up with some of the rest of the world that PSMA PET-CT is here. Um, 
Its commercial use is rolling out across the country. Some parts of the country have more access, but eventually it'll become our standard of care, as well as a likely approval of a therapeutic agent. So the era of theranostics is upon us. Oligometastatic versus polymetastatic disease is relevant, and prostate cancer genomics has made significant leaps, although its integration in clinical practice varies a bit. So just a word about oligometastatic prostate cancer. How do we define it? Remember, oligometastatic is not just a relevant issue in prostate cancer, all solid tumors. But in prostate cancer, it's obviously become increasingly important as next-generation imaging becomes more available and viable. We don't have a definition. Theoretically, it's a clinical state that represents potentially a state where there's low-volume disease, and it's a clonal disease, where you may be able to control some of those low-volume metastases potentially cure somebody, maybe change the natural history. We don't know the answer to these things, but the challenge is upon us. So intensification in castrate-sensitive metastatic prostate cancer. So um, just a backstory. So I happen to be one of the co-authors of Charted, which was the U.S. trial that led to the paradigm shift. And I will tell you that when that trial was planned, Within ECOG, Chris Sweeney, who um, is a leader in this field and was a, obviously a far-thinking individual, recognized that docetaxel was a very active drug in castrate-resistant disease, although it didn't move the needle very much in terms of survival. But any clinician who gives docetaxel to symptomatic patients recognize this is one of the most active therapies we have. The symptom benefit that happens after one cycle is very dramatic. But it didn't move the needle very much in survival. I will tell you that uh, Chris then asked the question, this is an active therapy, and if we intensify early, meaning in the castrate-sensitive setting where there was some suggestion that the potential for tumor kill might be different, it would make a difference. So I was at the table. I supported the trial. I thought there was not a single chance in hell it was going to be a positive study. But it was an important study that got done, and in fact, it was a strikingly positive trial. And it began to change how we think about the disease. Now, our European colleagues were a little skeptical, but when Stampede, one of the arms, demonstrated basically an identical result in terms of overall survival, it began to move the needle across the world because now you had two confirmatory trials. So docetaxel as intensification is a standard of care. The AR antagonists came next, and obviously abiraterone was approved in MCRPC. Um, Kareem Fazazi and others uh, led Latitude, and of course there was a similar trial done in the Stampede uh, series of trials. Lo and behold, we saw a very significant survival benefit using abiraterone acetate in both those clinical trials. There are differences in terms of the eligibility of patients, and I'll spare you the differences between high and low volume and poor and, and good risk, but the reality is these trials were similarly uh, impressive. Stampede, trial that's done in UK, is a framework where you add randomized trials one after another, and they've done a spectacular job in doing lots of studies. Because they've done studies with both abiraterone and docetaxel, even though they're not directly comparable, they can, within some reasonable design, compare the two treatments. And they're surprisingly very similar. So there's some comfort there that intensification is probably not a specific issue about one drug versus another, but the concept of intensification versus no intensification. Subsequent work with enzalutamide, apalutamide, again, ARIs showed very similar data. They all moved the needle. In some of those studies, they were all comer populations, so they didn't subset people out. And I think the reality is, is that what we've learned is intensification is the standard of care. How you do it is basically there are clinical judgments, and I'll talk about that. But to not do it should be the rare exception, not a common exception, because of the dramatic change in the natural history that we see. Recent data presented at ESMO by Dr. Fazazi. This is a trial that's, a, I think, an important study. It's a little complicated. Forearm, as you see, they're asking a number of questions. They're asking the role of radiation therapy in the metastatic setting. And they're also asking questions about abiraterone. So this is all built on patients who got docetaxel as intensification and adding these other therapies. The arms that are mature that were presented were the abiraterone arms. We're not really talking about radiation at this point. So patients got either, and this is de novo, you walk in the door, 
with high volume metastatic disease. That's the population. You're randomized to get ADT, docetaxel, as standard of care with abiraterone continuously or without. That's the question here. Primary endpoints are PFS OS. We've seen at ASCO GU the RPFS data, which was strikingly positive, and now we see overall survival data. So a median improvement of a year on top of what you already got with ADT and abiraterone. To me, this is a practice-changing standard of care. So what population, again, just to remind you, it's de novo. It's not people who evolved to metastatic disease. De novo, high-risk patients, docetaxel and abiraterone further improve survival. I expect that over time, we'll, we'll see more data from this asking the radiation question in a prospective way. And there are other trials, a myriad of other studies that are ongoing about intensification. So it's no longer you walk in the door with metastatic prostate cancer, you get ADT, and you're good to go. That's not an appropriate standard of care in 2021 in the United States. And if you treat patients and if you don't know this data, then you need to send the patient to somebody who does. Otherwise, I think you're probably not practicing in a way that you would, you would expect that a family member would be cared for getting the best therapy based on data. ARCHES, this is a little bit more data. There's going to be some information updated at this meeting. Uh, and again, this is just asking the question about enzalutamide. And you see again, <clears throat> a striking improvement in overall survival. And you can see the update that's going to be presented at the meeting, poster 62, looking at oligometastatic patients. So this is a real-world data. Um, and again, despite the fact that the data that you know, we briefly looked at and that you are all aware of shows a striking improvement in overall survival, uh, look at the tiny fraction of patients are getting intensified. Estimates are that only 30% of patients in the U.S. are receiving intensified therapy. I think that's a, that's a significant indictment in terms of, you know, how we take care of patients. Think about it. The docetaxel data has been around for, you know, it's almost 10 years. This isn't like new stuff, right? And it's not being applied broadly in the community. And again, um, it's obviously not being applied broadly in the community by lots of folks. This isn't one group of, of clinicians who aren't doing it. It's broadly. Um, and I think, you know, in fact, some community oncologists, medical oncologists, may not be applying it because they don't see these patients very often, or they make a judgment about uh, frailty of patients not being able to tolerate therapy. The reality is some of these studies have very good quality of life data. The, the EMA, the European Medicine Association, always requires quality of life data, and the quality of life data is very compelling. This suggests people do very well. They actually do better when they get intensified as opposed to doing worse. So given the fact that there's really no comparative data, how does one make a decision about which intensification you're gonna use? So again, no level one evidence. There are certain uh, features, right? So clinical factors. All of these therapies, docetaxel, abiraterone, the ARIs, have toxicity profiles that are well known. And there are times that a patient's sort of clinical factors <clears throat> would dictate. So a patient who walks in the door who has castrate-sensitive metastatic disease doesn't meet uh, a de novo um, definition, but has a PSA of 4.7 and has extensive bone metastases. You wonder about the AR production of that disease and the fact that it may have more of a neuroendocrine phenotype. That may be a patient you would opt to give docetaxel to as opposed to an ARI or abiraterone. Patients who have significant heart disease, who walk around with an A1C of 14, maybe abiraterone is not the best choice for that patient. So there are certain clinical factors that help you make a decision. Um, in some of the data, for example, in the ECOG charted study, what's called low-volume ECOG, um, long-term follow-up suggests that those patients probably don't benefit from docetaxel, so I would not give docetaxel to that patient. High-volume disease, there's, there's greater choices. So the reality is, is that these are some of the factors that you need to understand, and then there are some patient factors, right? Because it's, you know, when you have, you know, if you get to a point with a certain patient, you say, all of the therapies that we have are on the table, 
you have patient preferences. So we all take care of patients who basically say, Doc, I hate taking pills. I want this over with in my life. Well, docetaxel is over with in 18 weeks, and it's relatively well tolerated. You have, uh, you know, the patients who, uh, you know, had Aunt Emma had uh, breast cancer therapy 94 years ago, and her ears fell off, and she, he doesn't want that. So you're not going to give chemotherapy to that patient. Uh, and then there's perceived versus actual quality of life, right? There are certain people who say, I don't, you know, you've described this toxicity. They think it's a lot worse than it's likely to be, but I don't want that. Okay. You know, patient involvement. And then there are economics. Uh, in the United States, as you all know, uh, if you're a Medicare patient, I can uh, give you parenteral therapy without too much trouble. But any of these oral agents have significant copays for some folks, so there are occasional patients who, you know, their copay is whatever it is, they can't afford it, we can't figure out a way to support it, and parenteral therapy, docetaxel, is the choice. That fortunately doesn't happen very often, but occasionally it does. All right, so we're going to go back to both our audience virtually and the audience here. This is the same patient that we talked about before, um, and I'm going to ask you to sort of rethink your choice just to remind you briefly. 60-year-old who has recurrent prostate cancer. Somebody decided back in the day to give him oligometastatic therapy before probably oligometastatic therapy was a thing. And of course, now the patient has progressive disease. Now um, he's got extensive bone mats. He's asymptomatic. PSA is 66. And his T is 455, so he is not castrate. All right, Dr. Barada, have a look at that. Tell me what you think about our colleagues' thoughts and what your perspective is. You know, for a patient who developed clear uh, M1 by conventional scans, bone and CT scans in this uh, scenario, um, regardless of volume of disease, you know, um, you know, I think uh, doing treat intensification is for the most, uh, for most patients, the standard of care. We should do that. And um, offering a novel hormonal therapy, whether it's abratron or enzalutamide or apalutamide, would be appropriate in my, in my view. Just a reminder that, you know, the role for radium is in the castration-resistant disease uh, based on Alcinca data, um, so probably not here. And then, um, as Dr. Dreiser also mentioned, we're figuring out triple therapy. Um, it's per, for the novo high volume at study hormone sensitive disease, so it would not be applied here. And by the way, the trial was done piece one <coughs> with abiraterone and docetaxel. Um, and, and there's a um, kind of a breakdown of the analysis for ENZA that was due at the you know, plus minus docetaxel, actually, the study was not positive, or that subgroup analysis was not positive. So in other words, you know, right now, we, we are using triple therapy for de novo high volume based on PS1 data. For most patients, we're going to do a treatment intensification with other docetaxel, likely more often than high volume disease, and then novel hormonal therapy regardless of volume. So I would argue that perhaps I would offer this patient ADT plus abiraterone as one of the options here. So, you know, one of the things I get asked not infrequently is, you know, today when you see a patient in clinic, so this guy, you see him in clinic and you're trying to have a conversation, uh, the data that I just blew through is because you're a group of physicians and, you know, you, you understand the issues, but this is a really complicated um, discussion with patients, right? Back in the day when we were talking about ADT alone, um, if we're doing our job right, we spend a fair amount of time talking about ADT-related toxicity, right? There's a lot more conversation today because of what we know about the downstream stuff. And even that's a complicated conversation, getting somebody started. But now we're talking about intensification, which is a very complicated subject. So let me give you just an example. I happen to have seen two physicians, retired docs, within the last month, uh, both who evolved to metastatic disease, similar to this gentleman, um, and their cases are not very different. Uh, so, you know, one's an orthopedic surgeon, so you could argue maybe not as sophisticated as others, but, I mean, seemed like a nice guy. The other was a retired pulmonologist. So I talked to them about ADT, natural history of the disease, toxicity management, you know, the things they need to do in terms of changing lifestyle, the things that we have to do because of ADT. And then I give an overview of intensification. What I say is that, you know, for 80 years, we've used T suppression, either surgical or medical, and we changed the natural history with T suppression, right? And we've known that. But there was a window, right? Because back in the day, when we only had primary ADT, we talked about the natural history of the disease. You develop metastatic prostate cancer, your survival is, you know, two to five years, right? And when you develop castrate resistant, it was a year. 
Well, that era is over, fortunately. So we say that there are patients who have castrate-sensitive metastatic prostate cancer who have very prolonged survivals. Now, we don't know who they're going to be, right, because you can't pick the winners. But we, it introduces the concept of intensification. But I don't try to do that at the same discussion. What I do is I give an overview. I say, look, we're going to talk in more detail about the ability to add therapies to intensify your treatment because we now know their improvement in outcomes. So it sets the stage. I may give them, you know, if I know that I may be talking about abiraterone or, or enzalutamide or something, I may give them, a, you know, some pre-printed material and say, hey, take this home. We're going to cover this in more detail when you come back. And I bring them back four to six weeks later, make sure they're doing okay. By then, they've, you know, their T is suppressed. They, you know, they're doing okay or not doing okay. We can address that. But at that visit, I'll talk about intensification. Because, again, the shock of, you know, I'm about to take away, you know, something that's important to drive your metabolism and then try to do intensification and make you make a decision is just too much. So I found that breaking that up, and as I've talked to other colleagues around the country, almost all of us do similar things, mostly because it just makes sense. It wasn't any great insight. We just, you know it's too much for the patient to absorb. And I found that that works much better. How, how do you go about that? No, I, f I fully agree with you. That's right on. And, and by the way, you, you and others actually planned that in the trials. So in all these trials that Dr. Dreiser just alluded to, you actually you plan for starting ADT and, and bringing the other couple, right, on this cocktail and treatment intensification are, actually was allowed within 12 weeks, if you will, for most of the studies, which is exactly what happens in clinical practice. And that's what I do as well. All right. So we got a couple of questions, and I'll, uh, I'll ask the first one to Dr. Barada. Um, so... If a patient progresses to MCRPC, do we continue ADT? And if yes, should we change to another? Um, yeah, great question. So, <clears throat> so castration is the backbone of everything we do in the advanced setting. Actually, up to now, it's still the most effective treatment one could, uh, could offer to patients with, with advanced prostate cancer. So the short answer would be yes. You remain, you know, you should get your patients uh, remain castrated. How, you know, I, we don't care how you do it, we, although I should, replace, I, I should rephrase that to say we're now starting to care a little bit more because it happens that we now have an antagonist for LHRH called Relugalix, it's an oral uh, therapy, and <clears throat> it's now approved, at least in this country, for patients with advanced disease. Um, and, you know, a lot of discussions are, are around cardiovascular events and whether or not, you know, uh, whether or not we believe the data that, um, you know, did not compare head-to-head -head in the trial called HERO, we compared, again, low prolide, but the end point was not the number of cardiovascular events, but it seems like the antagonist is associated with fewer cardiovascular events. So that's one discussion we can have. As Dr. Dreiser alluded to, some patients actually do well with surgical castration. They actually choose that. But the vast majority of patients will opt it by uh, using an, a shot, right, LHRH agonist. So castration, yes, definitely. I would uh, not uh, stop it. And then the next question is... Oh, um, that's good. You got time. Okay. All right, let me just reemphasize that this question has been asked for a long time. What we know biologically is that the AR, the androgen receptor, through the disease course is upregulated. So one of the, there have been wonderful studies done by a number of translational investigators that showed that as you move from castrate sensitive to MCRPC, AR gets upregulated. So targeting the AR becomes important throughout the disease continuum. It's about T suppression. It's not about how you do it, right? So as Dr. Barada talked about, if you do a surgical ORC, if you do LHRH agonist or antagonist, it doesn't matter. It's T suppression. So there's no rationale to switch from one to the other as long as your T is suppressed. And the reality is that's the backbone of therapy. That never stops. Never. So I think ultimately understanding the biology there is the critical issue. And then with that, I'm going to turn this over to my colleague uh, who's going to take us on to castration-resistant disease. All right. Good morning, everyone. Once again, thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. Uh, and good morning virtually as well. All right, so we're going to be talking a little bit about castration-resistant disease. We'll start in the non-metastatic space, and then we'll move on to metastatic. And I'll be using um, the term metastatic and non-metastatic based on conventional scans, and I predict we'll have a little bit of discussion at the end about that. And we start with data from Dr. Smith, right? So this is actually a control group from a trial that was discontinued <clears throat> that basically shows the natural history of patients with non-metastatic uh, castration-resistant disease by conventional scan, CT and bone scan. And as you can see, there's an association with either, you know, a PSA, absolute numbers on the left, and also doubling time. The higher you have or the shorter doubling time that you have, 
the shorter is the interval until you actually develop disease in the scans. We now know the term as uh, you know, metastasis-free survival or time to metastatic disease, if you will. So that's a term that I'm going to be talking a little bit more. But just a reminder that actually PSA is helpful in this scenario. All right, and you know, we're not talking a lot about this until a few years ago. Um, but it, again, it's one of the, I, I really like this setting uh, uh, for a number of reasons, but I, I really like it because that's actually what happens in clinical practice, right? So unfortunately, we cannot cure everybody with localized disease, whether you do surgery, whether you do radiation, plus minus um, a certain duration of hormones. Some patients will recur. And at some point, sooner or later, you will treat them with uh, ADT, right? You suppress their testosterone. And at some point, they will develop castration disease. You scan them, you don't see disease uh, in CT and bone scans, and what do you do? And so these three trials, Prosper, Spartan, and Aramis, actually ask the same question. Does he help bringing on, in this scenario, a novel hormonal therapy with an antiandrogen uh, compared with placebo plus EDT? So all these men remain on EDT, on castration, and we brought enzalutamide or apalutamide and darolutamide versus placebo in those three trials. So the, the design of the trials is quite similar. We took patients with baseline PSA above two, a short doubling time. You, you saw the data from Dr. Smith here, so it helps us to understand why. And the primary endpoint, which is another important, uh, interesting point here, is the metastasis-free survival. And for, so, for, for some of us who have been uh, you know, long enough in the field, we know we've been talking about metastasis-free survival, and uh, the potential of M MFS to be surrogate for overall survival, right? We have that discussion probably a decade earlier. Um, and at the time, we didn't accept uh, a therapy called denuzumab in that scenario. But the bottom line is we all felt that you know, there's something about metastasis-free survival that could predict overall survival. So as, as MFS is primary endpoint, and OS is one of the key secondary endpoints, we all saw the data, right? First APA, apalutamide, and then enzalutamide, and then darolutamide, and we basically saw striking results favoring the addition of the novel uh, antiandrogen, whether it's apalutamide or enzalutamide or darolutamide, to ADT in, for patients with non-metastatic castration-resistant disease. And you'll see the hazard ratio is quite little, um, which translates you know, uh, into a significant reduction in terms of uh, uh, distant progression or metastatic disease or death, as you see there, you know, up, up to 70% in some scenarios there. Um, and, and in other words, the way I phrase it to my patients is, you know, if I bring an antiandrogen on board at the, in, this, in this setting, we're basically talking about going from kind of a year and a half-ish to about 40 months or so. Uh, with the addition of novel, novel hormonal therapy, which kind of proves the point if you like the, for those of you who like helicopter view, moving these therapies earlier in the course of the disease, um, you know, offers us a significant benefit in the long term. So there's actually three New England papers based on metastasis-free survival. So they all read out for the primary endpoint first. And then, um, you know, soon after, we got three other New England papers that uh, reflected the, sec the key secondary endpoint of overall survival, a positive in all three trials. And so the question that we became to ask is, is not, um, you know, should we use uh, uh, or, uh, an antiandrogen here is the question is which one to use, and that's about you know uh, quality of life and, and safety. And the reason for for us to bring that is because you know for the most part some patients will have more or less some side effects, including fatigue, you know some high blood pressure for some of these agents. Also, fall and fractures is an important topic, an important team in prostate cancer, as you all know. And so <clears throat> you know uh, we, we basically have now the standard of care. Uh, based on Prosper, Spartan, and, uh, and Aramis as, um, you know, the use of uh, these novel antiandrogens in combination with ADT for men with non-metastatic CRPC, not only because you are able to delay metastasis-free survival, but you're also able to prolong uh, clinically significant prolongation of uh, overall survival. And I, I, I did not show you quality of life data, but actually the quality of life data goes in line with what Dr. Dreiser said in a different setting that patients actually don't do worse, actually seem to do better on these uh, novel therapies. All right, let's move on. And now we're going to move on to some of the highlights um, you know, recent highlights, I should say, in patients who have disease in the scans and also uh, uh, castration-resistant disease. So now we're uh, shifting gears here to metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer. And we'll start with an European trial, this CAR trial from Dr. Fizazi and the group there. Um, is an European trial, very important trial in my opinion, 
because um, it tried to answer a question that we all had in the clinical scenario, right? So remember, we were at the time where most of us were, you know, we had docetaxel first, and then we were using abiraterone and enzalutamide in the castration resistant space. And a lot of us actually were uh, sequencing um, uh, one of these agents followed by the other, right? That was a common uh, practice. Um, and, and the question really is, we knew that cabazitaxel was approved based on survival data, based on tropic trial. So we had two chemotherapy, taxane-based chemo agents available. We have different novel hormonal therapies available. The question is, how do we sequence them? Is that a, is that a, does, that make a, does that matter? Does that make a difference? So in the CAR trial, we basically took patients with metastatic castration resistant disease who actually progress within a year on, uh, you know, uh, what basically Abby or Enza, novel hormonal therapy, and docetaxel was also required, but it, did, it didn't really matter. You could get doci followed by Abby or Enza, or you could get, you know, abiraterone and enzalutamide followed by docetaxel. You randomize those patients to either cabazitaxel, standard dose 25, or uh, one of the dealer's, uh, dealer's choice, abiraterone or enzalutamide. And as you can see there on the right, it's actually a positive trial. You'll see the radiographic progression-free survival at the top, um, you know, clinically and statistically significant, right? You basically all, you know, double uh, the, 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 the RPFS there, and also positive for overall survival. So in other words, when you have patients treated with a novel hormonal therapy and docetaxel, if you offer them cabazitaxel, you're, you're going to offer a prolongation overall survival and RPFS to your patients. So to me, this data is important because it kind of taught us a lesson about sequencing therapies in the metastatic um, CRPC setting. So, so to me, you know, I think CARD is important uh, because it actually answers a question that happens in, in, in clinical practice on a daily basis. And, 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 and we start kind of breaking down who are those patients who might benefit from this sequence. We don't know if it's everybody, as, as, as I show you the eligibility criteria for this trial, but perhaps patients who have a shorter time um, to castration resistant, um, you know, maybe patients who actually don't remain a long time on novel hormonal therapies, which is kind of, kind of almost a common sense, right? You, you probably want to explore other um, mechanisms that uh, go beyond the expiration of the androgen pathway, if you will, and also for uh, symptomatic progression of the disease. You know, I think chemotherapy, I think these, the, 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 if I had to summarize CAR data, I would say that it brought us back the concept that chemotherapy should be part of the management of patients with advanced prostate cancer, and I think that's an important lesson. Um, moving, uh, moving on to PSMA therapeutics. So I think lutetium um, PSMA is going to be one of the many uh, around. So just to go back a little bit, so, so remember, prostate cancer overexpressed prostate-specific membrane antigen in prostate cancer cells, right? So you have PSMA overexpressed there. You have a way to find it. And then what you do is you link that uh, PSMA molecule, if you will, um, with a radioisotope that releases radiation and kills those cells. So in other words, the way I explain my patients is you go in a taxi, you ask your restaurant, your restaurant will be PSMA cells, you go there and you go inside and you are able to kill those cells. So it's a target approach, if you will, and, um, and, and, and Vision was actually a large international phase three trial that asked the question, late in the game, because this was post-novel hormonal therapies, post-chemotherapy, post at least one line, no more than two uh, lines of chemo, and asked the question, you know, adding lutetium PSMA to best supportive care is better than best supportive care. I should just mention that the, the supportive care or was considered best supportive care here was kind of limited because it was limited to the novel hormonal therapies that you can use, for the most part, abiraterone or enzalutamide. You were to repeat one if patient had received both. Um, and, and also, the chemotherapy was not allowed, radium was not allowed. So it was kind of a limited, so steroids were allowed, radiation therapy was allowed. So some, some of my patients on this trial um, actually got radiation as best supportive care in addition to lutetium. And it was planned for four up to six doses once every six weeks. The data is quite striking, as you can see, right? So it has shown not only a prolongation of radiographic progression-free survival, which to me is clinically significant, you know, almost nine months there, um, favoring lutetium PSMA, and also a prolongation overall survival there, um, you know, 15.3 uh, uh, months. So in other words, we're all expecting this therapy to be available, all of us. Uh, we're, we'll see what the FDA is going to say about it, but I can tell you, 
after Vision closed, we had an expanded access. And it was, I've never, I don't remember, I'm not that old, so I haven't been around for that long. Uh, but I can tell you, patients were flying from all over the country and actually all over the world coming to see us in other places in the United States had a study open, number one. Number two, um, after we had uh, we, the Vision closed, closed for accrual, and we opened expanded access to lutetium PSMA, we actually saw the same movement. So we're still having patients coming in. And that's so true that the program was actually um, discontinued or shut down quite recently because of the demand. So I, the, the reason I'm telling you this story is because I want you to, you know, to um, understand this. This is going to be part of the management of patients with advanced uh, prostate cancer. And the question is not uh, when. I think the, the question is not if, is when. Because this study was developed a little bit late, in my opinion, in the, in the setting of castration-resistant disease. And my prediction is we're going to see it, you know, in a number of trials ongoing right now, we're going to see it moving earlier in the course of the disease. Uh, right now, we'll see what we're going to do with this. But I do believe that um, lutetium PSMA um, it, it will be soon uh, a standard of care uh, in, this, in this setting. We can talk a little bit about, 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 uh, about that in comparison with other therapies. So moving on to the importance of genomics and um, how does that impact patients with metastatic prostate cancer, right? So I'll talk you know, briefly about PARP inhibition, but before I do that, it's impossible to have a talk about you know, target therapy, precision medicine, without talking about genomics, right? So the way we sit down with patients, we go over the data about the importance of genomics. Number one is the genes we were born with, known as germline testing. Uh, and the second is the, the genes or the genomic alterations that the tumor uh, has, and that's known as somatic testing. So we can do both. And because germline, we expect about 12% of men uh, ha harboring uh, DNA repair defects. Um, but if you look at the somatic, meaning what's at the tumor level, you expect between 20, 25% or so uh, of those genomic alterations, which kind of tells you that you know, you, with one test, you might, be, you might miss part of the story. And so, you know, doing both is actually uh, a way for you to have complementary information, if you will. And when we're talking about these DNA repair alterations, a lot of you guys are familiar with that. We're basically talking about genes that, um, you know, uh, uh, get to proteins that have the chance to fix the problems at the DNA level, right? Because the cells replicate fast, they pick up problems there, um, uh, alterations, genomic alterations, and you can actually fix them, right? And so um, this group of genes, um, we actually happen to be able to do something with them. And for, for, uh, for folks, usually we speak for audiences that are general medical oncology as well. Actually, they treat other cancers. This story is not new for patients, uh, for, for physicians who actually treat uh, breast cancer, ovarian cancer, pancreatic cancer. It's very, very cool, actually. We're able to bring, bring this story into the prostate cancer arena, if you will. So starting with Olaparib and, and, and the first part I'm going to show you about, you know, actually this um, phase three profound data, very important phase three trial, there was leverage on prior studies, a New England paper from uh, the group from De Bono, uh, you know, about seven, eight years ago, that basically showed us that if you harbor a DNA mutation, you're, you're very likely to respond to a PARP inhibitor, right? So PARPs are enzymes that do that, that fix those problems at the DNA level, if you will. And if you have a, a defect in one of these DNA uh, gene um, group, you're able to um, benefit the most. So that was kind of a proof of concept study. He leveraged the phase three profound, as I mentioned. Uh, this is practice changes, what I'm about to show you, patients with metastatic castration resistant disease who progress on at least one uh, uh, novel hormonal therapy, whether it was abiraterone or enzalutamide, they were actually randomized in a two-to-one, in a two-to-one because at the time we kind of felt that patients were more likely to benefit from the PARP, from Olaparib, so more patients were randomized to Olaparib than the standard of care, which was dealer's choice. And dealer's choice here was either, you know, was the novel hormonal therapy we have, you have not used, so Abi or Enza in this scenario. We separated in two cohorts. You have the BRCA1-2 ATM in one cohort, and then you have the other alterations, more, you know, less frequent alterations, um, you know, like RAD51, uh, CDK, et cetera. And, um, and so uh, these data, as I was saying, and the primary endpoint, by the way, was RPFS, and OS was a, a, a key point, uh, a key secondary endpoint. Uh, but the data is strikingly positive as well. So in other words, Patients with metastatic castration resistant disease who progressed on abirenza and received Olaparib um, benefited in terms of RPFS, as you can see there, basically doubled the numbers, and also in terms of overall survival. And uh, based on these data, I'm showing you data for cohort A, so BRCA and ATM group of people. And, um, you know, and that actually led to the approval of this therapy by the uh, uh, regulatory agency in this setting. So 
So the problem about this is if you don't test, you don't find your patients. So Olaparib should be part of the management of patients with advanced disease for patients who harbor um, you know, gene, uh, uh, DNA uh, uh, genomic defects, if you will. And so this data is, is truly important in that setting. Now, the story does not end as far as precision oncology goes because this was just the first part of many. I'm going to show you the second, uh, the second important study here. It's called Triton 2. It, uh, it basically investigated a different PARP inhibitor uh, that some of you know as Rucaparib. And, and uh, this study is a smaller phase two. Everybody got Rucaparib, so it was a proof of concept. Response rate was the primary endpoint. Um, and uh, we also took patients, again, metastatic artificial resistant disease. However, these patients received not only one novel hormonal therapy, but also docetaxel. And you'll see why that's important in a second. So here's the data or the you know, efficacy data of interest, right? On the left, you have the overall response rate uh, by imaging. And that's about 43% or so uh, uh, for uh, partial responses <coughs> and, and, and uh, complete responses. And then on the right, you have the PSA responses over 50%. Um, so this is quite um, uh, important data here, again, for selected individuals with homologous recombination deficient genes, which is a way for you, is a process uh, uh, through which you can actually fix those bugs uh, in the, at the DNA level. And, and so the summary of this is actually we're now able to offer Olaparib and Rucaparib to our patients with advanced uh, castration-resistant disease. Olaparib had regular, uh, full approval. Uh, based on profound data. Rucaparib has this breakthrough designation, is a, um, a you know, accelerated approval, if you will. Um, it's not full approval because we need the data from Triton 3 that's ongoing, and uh, if that data is positive, then it became full approval. One of the differences of this approval has to do with the setting, right? So in oncology, a lot of the way we develop uh, therapies and they become available is based on the setting where we develop them, right? So Olaparib is approved um, um, for patients with germline or somatic or multiple combination gene defects, um, you know, uh, uh, post ENSA or abiraterum, whereas Rucaparib is actually approved for BRCA1, BRCA2, which one of the, was one of the cohorts um, in that uh, Triton 2 trial, and it was basically patients who have received um, abienza and at least one line of texane-based chemo, usually docetaxel. So um, that's that. Now, there's more PARP inhibitors being explored in prostate cancer. I'm going to go briefly over them. One is um, you know, <clears throat> um, it, it's uh, the Galahad uh, study, the phase two study with Niraparib, right? Um, and Niraparib is another PARP inhibition. Here we explore, uh, in this Galahad study, we're just taking biallelic uh, uh, DNA recombination deficient mutations here. So, um, you know, so we had to pre-screen a lot of patients to find our patients of interest. And um, I think I have a data here. Here it is. So you'll see the breakdown by BRCA1, BRCA2 compared with non-BRCA genomic alterations. And uh, what I think the teaching lesson from, from this data here, uh, one of the teaching points would be that um, you'll see a differential response with 62% for BRCA1, BRCA2 compared with about 23 or so percent for non-BRCA1-2 genomic alterations, and that's also true for the other endpoints like, you know, like uh, PSA decline or PSA responses and uh, circulating tumor cell conversions. So in other words, I think these data, together with other pieces of data, kind of start teaching us another lesson, and that is not all homologous recombination deficient genes are the same, and probably some will drive more, um, uh, a more predictive value to PARP inhibition and others, right? So that's, that's at least my take home from the Neuraparib data, very important data here. Um, in addition to that, I should say that actually quality of life was maintained, which actually was true across uh, the use of PARP inhibition in the prostate cancer scenario. So, so safety and quality of life, it should not be a reason for us not to use it. Um, moving on to tel telosoparib from Dr. De Bono, this telopro trial. Again, here's the breakdown for PFS. Uh, by uh, uh, BRCA1, 2, at, uh, 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 and non-BRCA, and overall. And it, the kind of similar message that we saw previously, right? So if you harbor BRCA1 or BRCA2, you had a median PFS of almost a year, compared with about three or so months, 3.5 months, for patients who did not harbor BRCA. I think the take-home message, again, is that it, it doesn't seem like all the genomic alterations confirm the same predictive value. Um, and once again, Tolazer was actually really well tolerated in general. And as we started using it more and more, we kind of get used to um, some of the potential side effects, like you know, some cytopenias, if you will, some fatigue. We're kind of managed that quite nicely now because we're using it more and more, if you will.
Um, and the story is not over, right? I, keep, I, keep, I could keep going on. So this is some of the ongoing studies, but guess what? Things are moving so rapidly that, for example, Propel, we already got a press release so, so showing that it's actually a positive study for RPFS, I believe. We have not seen the data, so um, I don't know what the data is going to look like, but just to give you an, an idea that um, a lot of the stories with par a lot of the story with PARP inhibition is not only monotherapy, but I predict in the future we'll see we'll have ways where we're actually going to compare or we're going to uh, combine PARP inhibitors with uh, what's considered standard of care for patients with metastatic disease, and that's the reason why we put this slide up for, for us today. All right, and talking about combinations, just a word about combination with cabazitaxel, right? So um, there's a, a number of, uh, uh, you know, uh, ongoing trials with cabazitaxel, not only in the CRPC space, but also in the hormone sensitive space. Dr. Dress alluded uh, to that earlier today. But I would just like, would like to highlight for 15 seconds or so the combination of, of, of cabazitaxel with carboplatin in metastatic castration resistant disease. So a lot of us were actually waiting for this data to get published. This data from Anderson, Dr. Paul Korn and others, and Anna Parisi and others. Important data because remember, you know, we still don't have an approval for a platin in the, in, the, in the prostate cancer world, even though a lot of us actually still use it in, 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 in our uh, clinical practice, right? So they asked the question whether or not the combination of carbocabazi would be better than cabazi alone. And um, actually, we did see a prolongation of not only uh, uh, PFS, but also response rate, favoring the combination. It seems like there's association, that's why we bring it here too, um, you know, is an association with it higher activity would actually DNA uh, uh, defects, as well as what we call these aggressive variants prostate cancer, known as TP53, RB1, ZTM. So how do you find, uh, and, and P10. How do you find those? Well, you need to test once again, right? And what we're doing now, we're actually doing a next generation sequencing testing. Uh, we test these, these patients uh, quite soon, or quite early, in, as long as they have stage four disease and in addition to the germline testing that I alluded to earlier. And it seems like patients who harbor those genomic uh, DNA uh, defects are more likely to benefit from the combination. Again, it's a phase two randomized study, uh, but nonetheless, I think it's important. And I already alluded to the fact that we're gonna, this combination also being explored in the metastatic uh, hormone sensitive space as well. All right, a final word for another combination that I think is relevant. So um, ACES trial, um, uh, you know, combined abiraterone and apalutamide. So I'm going to talk about that for a second here and also for um, um, a, another combination of two oral agents. So first, Abby with APA. So um, positive phase three trial for RPFS, right? As you can see there, uh, you know, 22 uh, uh, month, uh, over 22 months uh, versus 16 months for patients who receive a combination of the anti androgen apalutamide with abiraterone. However, so far we have not seen a difference, statistically significant or clinically significant difference in terms of median overall survival. So I have to say some of us were a little bit disappointed with that because, you know, we, we kind of thought a lot of times more might be better, but it didn't, it doesn't seem clearly to be the case. And I kind of bring the data from Alliance uh, group, which basically asked a similar question for uh, the combination of abiraterone with enzalutamide. Actually, this is also a negative study. And so what that tells us that the goal of the game here is probably is going to remain, in my opinion, to, re to be about sequencing and not so much, at least for the time being, combining oral therapies, at least as far as we know. Not target therapies. That's a different story, right? We're talking about, you know, uh, agents that uh, continue to explore the androgen signaling pathway, um, like uh, abiraterone or apalutamide or enzalutamide, if you will. All right, so, um, you know, take home points from, from this piece, right? So, cabazitaxel does improve outcomes uh, for patients with metastatic castration resistant disease, and so this, it should be considered. Um, it, it is a very reasonable uh, uh, strategy uh, for, for patients, actually, so is really strongly supported uh, for, for, for those who, who have progressive uh, uh, or aggressive disease, uh, rather, um, and maybe harbor less hormonally sensitive uh, driven disease, if you will. Um, PARP inhibition is important, has clinical activity, um, and we do have now two FDA approvals, so that we have two agents that we can use, maybe more in the future, um, and that opens the door for us to discuss the role of germline and somatic uh, testing, because if we don't test, you don't find your patients. And, and finally, we have a number of other therapy strategies that are coming very close to become available to us, and that's a good problem for us, right, when we start having a lot of therapies who have shown to uh, make people live longer and, and live better with, with prostate cancer. So um, um, that's it for the data. I'm going to present you a case.
we have a 71-year-old um, man that coming to see you, let's say, second opinion, for, to help him with managing his disease, right? Nine years ago, he had a, a PSA 8.8, um, high-risk prostate cancer with the Gleason uh, 4 plus 4, so a great group 4 there. Scans at the time were negative, and so he was offered definitive radiation therapy with long-term hormones. At the time, he was planned for two years, um, and, but the patient ended up receiving it continuously. He never stopped hormones. He's coming to see you many years later, right? He doesn't have symptoms from cancer, from prostate cancer. You know, he's having some ADT-related issues um, because he's been on concentration for that long. And, and PSA now uh, has been rising. It's now 8.6, went down, and now has been rising. Actually, doubling time, um, it's, it's about 4.5 months. Testosterone is at suppressed level, 17. And uh, a little bit of anemia, hemoglobin 10.6, normal uh, liver function tests. And you decide to order a PSMA uh, PET scan. And here's the results you know, uh, of PET scan, PSMA scan uh, in this patient. You'll see, I would highlight a couple of things there. So you'll look at the right femur there, there's a spot. Uh, you also see it in the left um, iliac uh, area there, right? And then on the right side, uh, you know, I think it's fair to say we see at least two very hot nodes they're in the context of where we are, very highly, highly suspicious for metastatic disease, right? I don't, have scan, I don't have pictures for bone and CT scan. I think that might be a point for discussion, um, whether or not we, can, we could see this in the, you know, in the CT scan or not. But anyway, PET, PET scan is positive in this, in this setting. So again, just to summarize it, 71-year-old patient, he does have metastatic castration resistant disease based on the PSMA scan that I just showed you. Uh, he doesn't have symptoms from prostate cancer. If this patient has a germline BRCA2 alteration, what would you advise as far as next step? So uh, this is the era that we're now in when you have PSMA PET and you see things that you didn't see before, right? So before, if you'd have done a CT and a bone scan, probably you wouldn't have seen anything. I don't, can't say that for sure. And then you would have said he is a non-metastatic castrate-resistant patient. One of the three agents uh, that Dr. Barada discussed, enzalutamide, was among your list. And you could say, I know that if I give this patient enzalutamide, there's the potential to improve his survival. So I'm going to think about that. But it's gotten more complicated, right? Those studies were not done with PSMA PET CT, right? So um, as my colleague Matt Smith has said in many instances, he would approach this patient just like he would have approached the patient with a negative CT and bone scan because. We didn't have those more sensitive studies when the study was being done. But there's a tendency for somebody to say, oh, well, I can see stuff, which means I need to target those, right? Stereotactic radiosurgery and piling on. We don't know the answers. I mean, there are two small randomized trials in the literature about oligometastatic disease with different endpoints. We don't know what the right answers are. Uh, you know, my worldview is to be somewhat conservative. I don't think our patients are washing machines where you basically throw everything at them. So I would be a little bit more conservative. I would say you have castration-resistant metastatic prostate cancer. And at this juncture, in a sense, I'm going to add a drug, right? I'm intensifying, right? I'm intensifying for two reasons. I'm intensifying both, you know, because I can sort of court, you know, look at the evidence for more advanced disease. But the reality is, I think enzalutamide is a rational choice here, as would be abiraterone, right? Because he's got metastatic disease. You don't have to worry about the indications anymore. So I think from my perspective, that's what I would do. Would I talk about SRS? You know, we have an institutional perspective. We're looking at all these oligometastatic patients. My radonks, um, to their credit, are not treating everybody that walks in the door that stands still long enough to point the beam. Uh, we're, we're taking a little bit of a long view, and we're trying to open trials so that we can address these prospectively. Um, I, yeah, I love your answer. I fully agree with you, Dr. Reiser. My only comment about um, Olaparib in this setting, so remember in oncology we develop drugs by the setting where they were explored. So profound took patients, yes, with metastatic castration disease by conventional scans, who progressed on at least one novel or one novel hormonal therapy, Abiranza. So in this scenario, so, um, so in this scenario, you know, one NHT would be the way to go whether it would be Enza or Abi, or as uh, Dr. Dreiser mentioned, maybe doralutamide or apalutamide would be all fine because you could do, make the point for conventional scans. The PARP, the olaparibine setting, would probably be, be um, used after that, knowing that the patient has a germline BRCA2, therefore very likely to benefit from a PARP inhibition uh, when the time comes.
All right, we're gonna, we only have a couple of minutes left, but there are a couple of questions that I think are important, so I'm gonna just pose them, and it's really around genomics. So remember, current guidelines, AUA, Advanced, Pract uh, Advanced Prostate Cancer Guidelines, and NCCN, germline baseline mutation for every patient with metastatic prostate cancer. That's a standard of care, looking for that 12% of DDR mutations, right? The role of next-generation sequencing in the MCRP space is a different issue, but I think germline as a baseline is, is an absolute, right? So there's a question here. Should all prostate cancer patients under active surveillance be tested for germline? Doctor, what do you think? So in general, I don't do it, um, but if you have family history, if you have a suspicions that, uh, the, that that might be come back positive and the patient's interested, is a discussion that I do have with my patients. Uh, but right now, the current guidelines that I alluded, you know, in a way, but also NCCN, et cetera, we should strongly recommend the discussion for patients with high risk, with recurrent, and stage four. Um, and so uh, active surveillance obviously is not one of those groups. It doesn't mean you cannot do it. It just means that, you know, we're not entirely sure what we're to do with it because, you know, if you have a BRCA2 patient with a Gleason 6 and you want to consider active surveillance, I'm not entirely sure we still know today what to do with those patients. Um, and so I think we need more data in that setting, but that will be kind of my short answer. All right, so now another question, which gives us an opportunity to talk about the setting for NGS and MCRPC. So uh, for should liquid biopsy or bone biopsy be used or both if there's no visceral disease? So uh, I am a, a believer that liquid biopsy in many settings provides useful data. Um, there, there have been some comparative studies between tissue-based assays as well as liquid biopsies. And, in, in general, they're in the mix. We're getting better with NGS. Um, we all know this is a bone tropic disease. I'm not a big fan of bone biopsies to get NGS. So in that setting, or actually, to be honest with you, I rarely do a separate metastatic biopsy unless it's being done for a patient going on trial. I will do liquid biopsies for next generation sequencing in the MCRPC setting. In the germline setting, I tend to use blood tests. Uh, you know, there are many commercial assays, so it's relatively straightforward. What's your practice? I, I fully agree, and I know we're running out of time. I just want to add that, um, so the data that I showed you is based on tissue for the most part, right? At least the approvals for the PARP inhibition, but also, you know, immunotherapy, for example. But it's actually true, we all have patients in clinic where we have used liquid biopsy to support the use of target therapy and immunotherapy for selected individuals, um, and that turned out to be true. Concordance is high, as Dr. Dreiser alluded to, so, um, so just uh, be aware that's an option uh, for, for us in, 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 in a clinical practice. And thanks for spending an hour with us this morning. Have a good meeting. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash TGE 860. This activity is supported by independent educational grants from Astellas and Pfizer Incorporated, AstraZeneca, Janssen Biotech Incorporated, administered by Janssen Scientific Affairs, LLC, Merck and Company Incorporated, and Sanofi Genzyme. This activity is certified by Medical Learning Institute Incorporated. This activity is developed with our educational partner, PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education.